I, uh, I wanted to share, I, and apologies, my first apologies essentially is to Alan. I said actually when I rocked up this morning, I'm totally changing everything up. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Because I originally was going to come and speak on the spiritual disciplines, which is really important and that we should be a part of. Because it's not about discipline. It's about creating health. Yeah? The trellis and the vine. Um, but that's another sermon. That's maybe next year. Um, the heartbeat this morning, and this is something that God's been working on me the last few weeks, so by all means, it didn't, wasn't like an overnight thing, but it was a message of hope. And I really just felt like specifically in this season, I've actually been going back. I feel like God's been bringing me back a lot of to what he was showing me and teaching me, or even in kind of the early part of this pandemic. Um, because, you know, we need hope. I think, if anything, we should be hope dealers in our world as the people of Christ, that's, that's, our mis- that's our message. No, I didn't say Coke dealers. Hope dealers. We deal in hope. We minister in hope. We are sharing hope. And, and I, I want to share this morning from an overflow. Not just an overflow that necessarily, we often think of, oh, I have to feel like, oh, so much better. Or I got to have all this sorted out. Or I, you know, I, I, I have to have everything in my life sorted to be able to minister out of the overflow. No, no, no. Our overflow is in him. It's our reliance, independence, and dedication in Him, our finding our trust and our hope in Him. So I want to read, we're going to read actually Psalm 42 and 43. Um, and so you're worried, it's not going to be the whole thing, don't worry, but you can go ahead and turn there. Um, and I'm actually going to put my phone on timer because I know, I know you guys don't mind. By all means, I, Pastor Allen's like, what? Pfft, you guys just go. Let the Spirit, we're going to let the Spirit run. But I also am conscious I'm going to share for just 20 minutes. Um, the, the, God doesn't need us to talk long to get his work done in our hearts. Amen. But Psalm 42, and I, I think for me, this has really come from a personal place of saying, God, I don't want to just do life as normal. We've seen, you know, kind of just ticking along and just kind of doing some good Christian things can get us only so far. But I think if anything, the pandemic has highlighted to myself as to many others that we, we've got to minister out of the overflow of God's ministry and heart to us. Finding our center in him. That's the heartbeat. And I, last night, I was saying to Pastor Allen as well, I saw, I don't know if you guys know, was on, because ABC and Four Corners had, a, had a, a focus on the whole flood, flood disaster around Lismore. And here I am in a hotel room last night thinking, this is, this is like the Holy Spirit. Wow, this is amazing. Um, why should we ever be surprised by that? But it was this like brokenness. It was this heart of like, wow, it's a community that's hurting. A community that's gone through a lot. And it's a community as well, I think for all of us in our own lives, in our own circumstances, that we can look around, we can look at our world, we we'll look at the war in Ukraine, we look at the stuff that's going on in Sri Lanka right now and think it's all hopeless. Oh, it's just too much. I'm over it. I'm tapping out. And Psalm 42, and actually Psalm 42 and 43, it was all one, and we broke it up in two into English. But essentially, the heartbeat is being this longing for God, a longing with God. And I want to, uh, yeah, I want to read it, read it out to you. We'll read it together. So if you have it in your Bibles, uh, we'll jump around a few of the verses, but read along with me, starting with, with verse one there. He writes, As the deer pants, longs for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, my God. My soul, my inner self, as it says in the Amplified, thirsts for God, for the living God. When will I come and meet with God? I wonder, will I ever make it? It asks in the message. In verse 5, and then it's repeated in verse 11 and And then in chapter 43, why, my soul, are you dejected? Why are you in such turmoil? Put your hope in God, for I will still actively, presently praise him. Verse 8, the Lord will send his faithful love by day. His song will be with me in the night, a prayer to the God of my life. I will say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Does it sound familiar? Some repeated in Jesus. 
chapter 40, jump down to start of chapter 42. Vindicate me, my God. Clear my name. Declare me innocent. Fix this, right? You hear this heartbeat against the ungodly people before me. Rescue me from the deceitful and unjust person. For you are the God of my refuge, my only safe haven, as it says in the New Living Translation. Verse 3, send your light and your truth. Let them lead me. Let them bring me to your holy mountain, to your dwelling place. Then I will come to the altar of God, to God who is my greatest joy. And then he finishes again with that refrain somewhat differently. And the first part you think of it is like, oh, why my soul? Why is it so disparaging? Why is it so discouraged? Hope in God. But now it's almost like it changes. And then you actually see a change in the Hebrew where he changes. He says, you know what? Why my soul are you dejected? Why are you in turmoil? Put your hope in God. I want to just speak real briefly and, and just share some insights that I feel like I've been feeling and hearing in terms of how we see hope in the Psalms, how we hear the, the heart of hope in Psalms. But we see this, we see this even in, in chapter 42 in the Psalmist. And if, you, if you've read some other of the Psalms, sometimes the Psalms are the only parts of the Bible that I can read. Yeah, even I have moments like that. I go through seasons in my life and I just like, wow, I can't read many other parts of the Bible, but I'm drawn to the Psalms. Because the Psalms express the brokenness, the up and down, the experience of life that we walk through the realities. And isn't it heartening <laughs> that God knows us? And I, Christina, I'm sorry if I've got your name wrong, but even in your story this morning, such a powerful testimony of how God knows you and how he has known you in that place. He knows us in our brokenness. And notice as well, in case you're looking for a, a quick fix solution, four-step program necessarily, there's none of that here. The psalmist doesn't necessarily end with an answer. Doesn't know one of those gotcha, I got all the answers for you moments. Instead, he ends in this place of genuine, honest, open expression of our faith. An expression of our human frailty and our need. Our utter dependence on him. The first point that I would want to make in terms of, and this is somewhat straightforward, um, but hope is something contrary to our experience. Hope, intrinsically, is not necessarily something we experience all the time. Now, you might be thinking, okay, yeah, obviously, Dan, duh. You know, I mean, have you looked at Lismore? Have you looked at around my life? Have you seen my marriage? Have you seen the situations that I might be eyeing myself into? There's a reality that that's not, that's not our everyday experience. And so actually maybe, maybe a deeper reflection of that, maybe even a more powerful wording of that could be, we must befriend the longing. You see in verse 1, as the deer pants, there's a thirst for God. As, the deer, as I long for, you are my food, as if you are my, I crave for you like my daily food. In verse 2, we must befriend the longing. I just finished reading a book. You guys might have seen the movie. Uh, it was first a book, as good a lot of movies are. But uh, Into the Heart of the Sea. You guys ever heard of this? Into the Heart of the Sea. Okay. It's okay if you haven't. It's, I, don't, I don't remember if the movie is any good or not. I, I think it was okay. Directed by Ron Howard. Probably a good thing. Um, Into the Heart of the Sea. It's a book based on the story of the whale ship, the Essex. And the Essex was a whale ship that was actually rammed by a big white whale and was sunk, was rammed twice. And, and you, that might sound a bit familiar to you because it sparked another story that we've probably all read, or at least in grade school, Moby Dick. You guys know the story of Moby Dick? Yeah, okay. So Herman Mivelle was a, a whaler. He worked in a whale ship not long after. He met some of these guys, and he heard their story, and he inspired him to write Moby Dick. But the story of Into the Heart of the Sea really is about the whale ship Essex and what happened next. Because of the 20 men that were on that boat, only like two of them survived. And it was after over 93 days they sailed, over 4,000 miles in the open ocean. And it was this crazy story of survival. And I won't go into the details, but there's this reality of, wow, first of all, we need water to survive. There's this ultimate reality of like thirst. That's a huge theme 
of their story, thirst, but also the craving for food. And the psalmist here is befriending the longing and saying, I thirst for you. I hunger after you. Are we hungry for him? We must befriend the longing. And can I point to you? Remember you said, oh, we started the sermon talking about the hope in the Psalms. This is the start of hope, guys. This is the start of hope. Because until we befriend the longing, hope is something we always got to manufacture, isn't it? Hope isn't something we, is, is intrinsic to us. Hope isn't something that we own. We must befriend the longing to walk with him. Secondly, and this is where you see the psalmist land. He says, hope in the Lord. And I closed my book, so I'm going to open it up. Put your hope in God, for I will still praise him. Praise is not contingent on the experience. Praise is not contingent on the experience. Our hope is not contingent on the experience. Because as I've said already, the experience is often not very hopeful. We must be in this place of saying, you know what? The word praise, we can trust him. Uh, the word praise, literally, the Hebrew word here translates throw down. Isn't that cool? Uh, or cast off, throw away. It's used in conjunction even with an arrow, as you might shoot an arrow, you throw it away. It's used 68 times just in the Psalms for praise, translated praise. I will still praise him. A throwing up of the hands, a declaration. <laughs> Regardless of the experience, regardless of the context that we find ourselves in, we can praise. We can throw our hands up and we can say, you know what? I trust you, Father. Isn't that so cool? Have you ever seen kids throw up their hands in desperation? They have a really funny experience. And they're, <laughs> they're just like, they throw up their hands. I, my, I have a four-year-old at home, little Matthew. He was in that picture. Um, and he's, as we would say, all boy, right? Crazy, running around. And he loves monster trucks. He's into his monster trucks. And so he was running around the other day asking over and over again, asking everyone, his sisters, us, me, uh, mom, uh, uh, toy tugger, toy tugger. He kept saying toy tugger, toy tugger. And he's kind of learning how to talk and all this thing. I'm thinking, what is, what is he saying? I mean, it was, it was like desperate. It was like he keeps saying this toy tugger. He knew exactly what he was looking for. We are thinking, okay, it's got to be a monster truck. We can't find this monster truck. We found a monster truck. We're giving no, it's not the one. It's not the one. Well, okay, we, we give up. And we, he just threw up his hands. Remember, he just threw up his hands like, huh, you don't get it. And actually, uh, come to find out, it was the next day we found what he was looking for. It was this toy truck called Roger Dodger. Ah, the parents in the room, I know, Roger Dodger was the monster truck he was looking for. But he said toy tugger. He didn't know how to say Roger Dodger understand but there was a desperation and he he was just desperate he just threw up his hands like oh. I wonder if we can feel that way sometimes we can look around in our experiences we can look around in our experience of life we can look around at our town and think wow this is too big this is too much actually there's a cause of praise in that moment because we don't throw up our hands. Matthew didn't throw up his hands and say, I give up on you guys. You guys aren't my mom and dad anymore. Forget this. I'm out. I'm out of here. No, it was, uh, I, can't, I can't make this happen. I give up. I'm trusting, dependent on you, Jesus. That's ultimately our place of praise. That's where we can come to. And sometimes it's a fight. Sometimes it's a battle. Sometimes we need to take ownership of that journey of saying, you know what? Regardless of the experience that I'm in right now, I want to praise. I need to praise. In, in Philippians chapter 4, you see this affirmation from Paul where he says, rejoice in the Lord always. Such a big deal. He even says it twice, right? Rejoice in the Lord. Again, I say rejoice. Can we even rejoice in the Lord always? Well, evidently the apostle Paul thought we did. It's this calling. Philippians was written to a persecuted church, was written to a church in trouble, in trial, in tribulation, in struggle. And it, yes, it uses the word rejoice and joy, and there's joyfulness throughout the, the letter. So much so. To praise in the midst of our trial. There's hope in that. There's hope in that. There's an affirmation that our hope is not in our own. And finally, last but not least, I want to land here is that hope, hope is ultimately 
a known, a concrete entity that is outside of us. Our hope is in him. You know, in that book, The, the, the Heart of the Sea, many of the times the sailors, they lost hope, but they gave up hope. We've heard that phrase before. Oh, they, they gave up hope. Uh, and we understand what that means in a certain sense, but I, I want to, at this point, challenge that because actually some, hope isn't something that we have, own, that we can give up on. No, hope is in him. Hope outlasts and outlives and sustains us. Our hope is beyond us. And it's really interesting, you know, in the New Testament, hope is primarily eschatological. We're talking about Christ. We know we heard of Jesus Christ. And if you've never heard the message, the hope, the redemption of what Pastor Allen even just referenced there of his life, his death, his resurrection, please, can I encourage you Can I implore you more than anything else? This is our center point. This is our starting place. Our hope is in Jesus. But we got to remember that even in the Psalms, they didn't have the revelation of Jesus yet, okay? This was before Jesus had come to earth. And so the psalmist is putting their hope in something that they, they don't even have a confidence. They don't even have the knowledge around Jesus of. It's a concrete expression of hope. That's beyond our experience. That's a powerful thing. And that struck me dumb. I remember reading that and feeling that for the first time, being like, wow, okay, I can start to get my head around hoping in Jesus. But actually, this hope, it is in Jesus. It is in Jesus. But it's a hope in God. It's a hope in an expression, a known reality. They have such a knowledge of who he is, such a confidence of walking in faith with him that it changes their outlook. It changes the whole perspective in terms of when they say, they say, oh, why am I so downcast too? Why are you downcast? Put your hope in God. Hope is this concrete reality that's felt and known beyond our experience in the moment. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm encouraged and I, I, this is the last story I'll share you know, many of us within Compassion and for myself, we've walked streets of poverty. We've seen poor situations around us. And I actually remember being in, in situations in Thailand where I'm looking at this a, a poverty situation and realizing that I can do nothing necessarily. I can do nothing in my own strength to make the difference there. And I, I feel like there might be some other people even here this morning that have had something similar Maybe you've had something similar in, in your own town, in your own neighbors, in your own experience. If you're looking at a brokenness and you're saying, wow, it's not even about money. It's not that I could just, you know, I, there's nothing I can physically do right now to change the situation. And that can feel very hopeless. But may I encourage you this morning that that is our starting place of hope in him. You might have heard that phrase that God doesn't call us to be successful. He calls us to be faithful. And first and foremost, we've got to come to this place where our dependence and our hope is in him. Because if it's not in him, guys, it is shaky. It is unstable. It is nothing that we can hope for. It's not in money. It's not in relationships. Our hope is clearly on him. And I... And I feel like uh, for many years, that, those experiences, and in many ways, the experiences still can still kind of traumatize you, can kind of haunt you. You feel like, oh, I wish I could did, did that. I wish I did this in that situation, or I wish I could have made the difference there. And may I encourage you, it's not anything you could do or could have done or can do to make the difference. Our hope is in him. May we always be pointing to him. And God is redeeming some of these experiences and moments in my life to where I remember walking down the streets of Thailand and it being, and it, it, that's coming back to me now as a gift. It's a gift of seeing the hope of God happening in their life and in their story. Not in tangible ways that I can necessarily say, oh yeah, that's, that's cool, that's a great answer. I, I feel good about that now. But actually, their hope is in Him. And I can affirm that and I can see that. And it's like your eyes are open to the reality of hope all around us because our hope is ultimately in him. May I encourage us that we, God doesn't need us, guys. 
God doesn't need us individually. I want to remind ourselves, I remind myself that people that are in ministry, serving in ministry, God doesn't need you. No. Wait, Dan, we might respond. We might react to that. Oh, no, 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 no. God doesn't need you. God is taking care of your family. God is providing for your family. God is, God is going to heal the marriage. God is going to work in those situations and those relationships. God doesn't need us. God calls us. God has invited us to walk with him. And as soon as we try to walk our own strength and do it on our own, it ain't going to work. It ain't going to work. It's got to be in him. I love seeing, you know, you guys got these kind of rotating slides up here, and, and there's one about a united prayer. And I love seeing um, and the opportunity that you guys have had as a church to create a space where uh, ministers in this town, in this region, in this area can come together and begin to pray and to seek his face. Our hope is always in him. May we never, never lose sight of that. And when we do, when we go through the ups and downs, the experience, the very human experience that the psalmist expresses, may we come back to that in verse 1. My soul longs for you. My soul seeks for you. Hold on to these tenets. Hold on to these words. If it's all right, I was going to ask if we get the worship team to just come back up and just to play us just a song, whatever is on your heart, to lead us in this place of seeking and relying on him. May we take the moment now to affirm and put our place and our hope in him. Can we close our eyes? And I'm just going to just highlight what, what, what does God say about himself just in these two verses. Just in chapter 42 and 43, he's necessary. He's our only necessary thing. He satisfies our thirst. He satisfies our cravings like food. He's our defender. He's been with us in hard times and in good. He's my savior. He's a source point of my happiest thoughts and memories. He's beyond the chaos of the experience in verse 7. He's faithful in his love to us, verse 8. He's a song. He's our rock when it feels like he's forgotten us. God is present in the midst of the storm in verse 10. In chapter 43, it reminds us that he's our champion. He's our rescue. He's our refuge and our safe haven. He's our light. He's our truth. He leads us and he invites us into his holy dwelling place. He is our greatest joy. Let's take this time to sink into his hope and to minister out of his fullness.